Awesome. All right, uh, thanks everyone for coming to our third installment for this seminar series. Uh, as you might recall, we're going through Richard Bamler's notes on three-dimensional Ricci flow. Uh, James left off uh, in the definition of Ricci curvature. And now we're going to have Jack take us a bit more through Romanian geometry. And I think that the what, what we're aiming towards with Jack's talks is an understanding of some of the some of the basic examples of Ricci flows, including Einstein metrics and Ricci solitons. So I'll leave it to you, Jack. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Tim, for the introduction. And uh, thanks to Glenn, Paul, and Tim as well for inviting me to do this speech. So yeah, like Tim said, um, the goal of my talks is really to um, understand some particular solutions of Ricci flow. So just to remind everyone, Ricci flow is given by the following PDE. Okay. Um, so before we jump straight into um, particular solutions, of course, on the right-hand side of Ricci flow, we have this um, Ricci curvature. Now, in general, the Ricci curvature is a complicated object. So it's not necessarily easy to just see what a particular solution might be on a general manifold. So before we jump into uh, particular solutions, we have to sort of take a step back um, and talk about curvature a bit more. So James um, introduced uh, curvature last week. So we're gonna talk um, a lot more about curvature today. So in particular today, we're actually gonna be discussing um, space forms. So these are Riemannian manifolds with constant sectional curvature. Uh, and so the main result that we're aiming towards is um, that is a classification of all simply connected um, complete Riemannian manifolds with constant sectional curvature. And we'll find that if this is the case, then we're either isometric to Euclidean space, isometric to hyperbolic space or to the sphere. Okay, but in order to, um, so, so really I wanna try build up to a sketch of the proof. There's no way we're gonna be able to go through the proof in um, a ton of detail. So um, what we do want to do though, is um, introduce several topics that um, you, you would need in order to understand the proof. Okay, so before we do that, let's first, um, just talk a little bit about rescaling. So um, by rescaling, I mean, if we make a, um, if we rescale our metric, so we multiply our metric by um, a positive number, then how does this affect our curvatures? So, we have that the connection remains unchanged um, when we make this rescaling. Now, our Riemannian um, curvature tensor gets a lambda squared out front. Ricci's left unchanged. Um, and so of course, th this property here is gonna be important later on when we keep discussing Ricci flow. Uh, scalar curvature gets a lambda to the minus two out the front. Now, um, the important one for today is the sectional curvature, which gets a lambda to the minus two out front as well. Now, the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because if we have constant scalar curvature, um, constant sectional curvature, sorry, then by making a, a um, by rescaling our metric, we can always assume that we're either in the case of um, scalar curvature equal to one 
scalar curvature equal to minus one or scalar curvature equal to zero. Okay. Okay, so we can assume we're in one of these three cases. So uh, let's begin with some examples of um, spaces with constant sectional curvature. So the obvious example is um, Rn. Right, and so we have the, the Ricci curvature on Rn is zero. So this is going to give us sectional curvature equal to zero. All right, so um, as we only um, Brief, uh, I only introduced curvature last lecture. Um, we thought it'd be good to um, go through a worked example of calculating curvature. So I thought I'd calculate the curvature of the sphere. Okay, and so how we're going to do this is use the fact that the sphere is embedded in Rn plus one. Okay, so here's the image. And we're going to take a point P um, in SN. And so we're going to take two smooth vector fields um, on SN as well. And we're going to calculate the connection of, um, of, of SN. So first of all, um, the connection of y in the direction of x at the point p. So since we're living in Rn plus 1, how this works, right, um, if we go back to our um, first course in differential geometry, is we calculate the directional derivative um, of y in the direction of x in, in Rn plus 1. And then we project it down onto the tangent space at p. OK, so if we write that out, that looks like this. So this is the directional derivative. And then we take that directional derivative and we project it down. So n here is my normal vector. We project it down onto the tangent plane. So um, something to note is that Our vector field, since it lives in the tangent space of our um, of Sn, is always equal the inner product of the normal with, say, the vector y, the vector field y, is always zero. So, in particular, the directional derivative in the direction of x is also always to zero, uh, always equal to zero. So we can expand this out using the chain rule, uh, the product rule, sorry, to get the following identity. Um, and now we can use the properties of the directional derivative to actually conclude that this guy is equal to x. So what we have here, is that x, y, like this. And so um, we can replace this term up here with this term here. Like so. 
And so now, our Ramanian curvature was given by the following. So we can repeatedly, um, repeatedly apply this formula. So we, we apply it first once in here and then a second time on the outside um, to expand this all out in terms of our directional derivatives. Um, and then we simplify everything. So we collect like terms and we end up with the following. So I can speak more about the details of this if people want me to, but in the interests of time, I thought I'd skip the computations there. But in particular, this is gonna give us that the, the Ramanian 04 tensor is this. Okay, so then by setting um, Z to be equal to Y and X um, and W to be equal to X and assuming that X and Y are orthonormal, then we can calculate the sectional curvature. So, hey, hey, Jack. Yep. Is that second term right? No, that's no, not. Sorry, this one should be a Z. All good. It's a typo. Thanks for that. It's all right. Oh, cool. or is it the other one that should be a Z? So this is uh, Y, Z, X, W, X, Z. Oh, yeah, w. yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, I was reading your first. I was reading. I was actually reading yeah, your sorry. first X is a Y is an X. Sorry, Sorry about that. that. That's... that's just me not being able to read. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> all right, all that's right. better. Thanks for that. That's all right. Man. Yeah. So, um, yep, we take X and Y to be orthonormal, and we're going to get the sectional curvature. Right, so, sigma is a span of X and Y is equal to one, which is good, okay. And yeah, so of course the, the third example is the hyperbolic plane of, con uh, of spaces with constant sectional curvature. It's a hyperbolic plane and that has sectional curvature equal to minus one. Okay, so yeah, so we have these three manifolds, um, all with constant sectional curvature. And like I said, the, um, the killing hop theorem, which is what we're going to build up to, says that if M is simply connected and complete, then up to rescaling, these are the only three manifolds with constant sectional curvature. Okay, so in order to um, discuss the proof, we first need to take a, a step back and talk about um, geodesics and parallel transport. So these are important concepts that come up time and time again when you try to um, prove these kind of kinds of results. So if we've, if anyone's done a first course on uh, Ramanian geometry, which I think a lot of us have. Um, we, we, we all um, have an intuition for what a geodesic is. So a geodesic, right, is the generalization of a straight line to 
uh, Riemannian manifold. So if you're an ant living on your manifold and you walk in a straight line, then that is a geodesic. So um, an obvious example is again on the sphere. If, if I was um, standing on the earth and I started walking, to me, it appears I'm walking a straight line, but to an astronaut in space, I, I'm walking around a great circle on, on the surface of the sphere. So another property of geodesics is they locally minimize length. So if you have two points that are very close to one another, the geodesic is the shortest path between those two points. Now in, in RN, um, I said that the geodesics were straight lines. So how do we, ca um, how do we characterize straight lines? Well, they're simply the, the curves with zero acceleration or said in another way uh, with constant velocity. So um, on a Romanian manifold, we don't necessarily have a concept of um, acceleration, um, but from James's talk last week, we introduced the um, connection, which actually does allow us to, to, to think about these sorts of um, concepts. So on our manifold, our connection allows us to differentiate vector fields. Okay, so this leads to the following definition of a geodesic. So if we have a curve gamma, which goes from an open interval in R to our manifold, then it's a geodesic if the following property holds. Okay, for, for all t in our interval. So some notation here, gamma prime of t is equal to the differential of gamma at t in the direction d dt. So, um, so this is, um, so we can write this equation here in our local coordinates. So if we do that, we get the following um, nonlinear ODE. So I'm using the summation convention. And um, these gamma K, I, J are the Christopher symbols, which um, arise when we discuss the, when we discuss the connection. So an important thing about um, the, these equations is that we can use um, theorems from ODEs to get a uh, short time existence and uniqueness. So given a point M, uh, a P on the manifold and V in the tangent plane at P, um, there exists a unique geodesic for some short amount of time, such that um, gamma of zero is P and gamma prime zero is V. So a related concept to geodesics is that of parallel transport. Um, and so this is when we wanna, we, we have a vector on a, um, a curve and we wanna move that vector around the curve while keeping it parallel 
to the curve, okay? Hence the name parallel transport. So we're transporting the vector um, while keeping it parallel. So, uh, excuse, excuse me, Jack. Um, yep. Maybe a slight, slight typo, typo in your uh, speech there. You said uh, keep it parallel to the curve, but I thought the, uh, the idea behind parallel transport is that you keep it sort of parallel yeah. to what it was at the start rather than the curve. Yeah, yeah so, sorry, you're, you're right. You're, you're keeping it parallel to, to what it was at the start. Uh, thanks for that, Tim. <laughs> okay, so um, yes, so we have a, um, so we want to begin with a, a curve. Okay, so we're given a curve C. And um, a vector field V along C. By which I mean that, um, so V maps from I to the tangent bundle such that V of T is in tangent space at the at C of T for each T. And then we say um, V is parallel along C if this holds. So this is our covariant derivative. Okay, so just like um, with the geodesic equation, we can write this out in local coordinates and we obtain a similar equation to before. So another thing to notice is that a geodesic is just a curve whose velocity is parallel along itself. Okay. So um, really the point of parallel transport is it allows us to, in a sense, transport geometric data um, along curves in our manifolds. So, um, if we have an exact, if we do an example of this, so again, I'm going to come back to my old friend, the sphere. Okay. So um, say I'm on uh, a great circle um, and I have firstly let's think about a, a vector that's tangent to that circle and I want to parallel transport it around my great circle well if I think about um, how I calculate the connection um, of a sphere I first would take the directional derivative in rn plus one and project it back onto the um, tangent plane. Now, with circular motion, the acceleration, right, of circular motion always points directly into the center um, of the sphere. So if I were to just take the velocity vectors around as I'm going around this great circle, well, then the acceleration in Rn plus one would be always pointing into the center of the sphere. And so when I project back onto my tangent plane, it's always gonna be zero. And so this shows that um, this, this vector is being parallel transported, but since it was a velocity vector, it actually shows that the great circle is a, a geodesic. Now, as a, as a sort of non-example, 
say if I tried to do the same thing except off a great circle. So I have, I'm looking at the vector field that's the, the velocities of um, constant circular motion around this um, circle. Well, so again, the, the acceleration is going to be pointing into the center of this circle. But since my circle is not um, a, one of the great circles, what you find is when you project back onto the tangent plane, it's not going to be, it's going to be non-zero now. So you're going to have a small component when you project back um, in this direction, I feel. So this shows that this isn't a geodesic. And in fact, what you find is that if you were to parallel transport this initial vector round, you're going to get it's, it's going to slightly move round. And when you come all the way back around to the beginning, it's going to have, it's going to be at a different angle to the original vector. So associated with um, geodes geodesics is the so-called exponential map. Um, now the exponential map allows us to, um, sorry, it allows us to understand how geodesics change when we um, vary either the initial point or the initial velocity. So what we want to do is, um, so given a, a point P and a velocity um, from in TPM, we, we know that there exists a, a unique geodesic. So we define the exponential map, so given a point V, in the direction v is equal to um, that geodesic in the direction v evaluated at time one, provided that our geodesic lives long enough to reach time one. Okay. So um, in this sense, our exponential map maps from. Um, TPM to our manifold like this. So some properties of the um, exponential map in the following. So first of all, um, the exponential map is, is a smooth map. Now um, we can recover our initial uh, geodesic from the exponential map. So, so for each V in TPM, Like so. Now, um, the next, and, and this is probably one, um, one of the most important properties of the exponential map is it's locally um, a diffeomorphism. So for, for each P in our manifold, there exists a neighborhood uh, V of the origin, and this is in TPN. In the neighborhood U um, of P in M. So, 
such that the exponential map from V to U is a diffeomorphism. Okay, so first of all, this allows us to use the exponential map to define coordinate charts, and these are called normal coordinates. So normal coordinates um, often dramatically simplify um, formulas. Um, it's also this property here is going to be fundamental um, in the proof of the uh, Holt Killing theorem because we're going to use this, uh, we're going to use the exponential map to construct our isometry between our manifolds. So um, something that we would like to understand, I guess, um, with the exponential map is how big our neighborhood is. So it, so I've, I've said that it's a locally, it's a diffeomorphism, but can we make it a, a global diffeomorphism? Okay. And so we'll get to that in a moment. Now, the final property I wanted to mention is that if M is connected, then M is complete as a metric space. If and only if um, our exponential map is defined on all of um, TPM. So this is the Hopf-Reno theorem. So this is also going to be important. Now, the final topic I wanted to mention before sketching this proof, um, and of course, uh, we haven't been going into detail into each of these things, and um, we're not going to be able to go into detail, too much detail with um, these either. So the final topic is um, Jacobi fields, which also come up in the proof um, of the Hopf killing theorem. So the idea behind um, Jacobi fields is that we want to understand how does curvature affect the behavior of nearby geodesics. So um, does, does curvature make geodesics come together, go apart? How does curvature affect um, uh, nearby geodesics? So um, the Jacobi equation, uh, which is what defines Jacobi fields, allows us to um, measure the effect of curvature on a one parameter family of geodesics um, in a quantitative way. So how do we do that? So we start off with um, a vector in TPM, and then another vector in TV of TPM. So I'm going to draw a diagram in a moment. Um, and then we consider what's called the variation through a geodesic. So this is. Um, a curve, sorry, a function gamma from zero, one cross minus epsilon to epsilon to m. And it's defined by the following. So um, here, this V of S is a curve in TPM. Um, that begins at V and um, has velocity W like this. So I think it's better to 
to draw the picture. So this is what this all looks like. So on the bottom here, we have our manifold M and on the top we have TPM. Um, and we look at, we're looking at straight lines along here. So we have, this is our curve V of S. And this is V. And we have a velocity W along the curve V of S. So it's um, tangent to the curve V of S. And then we, we push this back down to our manifold via the exponential map. And we get something that looks like this. So this is P. This is sort of the, the picture to keep in mind as we do this. Now, the idea is that we want to, um, we want to understand the partial derivative of gamma in the direction um, with respect to S, sorry, at one zero, because somehow this measures the, um, the rate of spreading out of geodesics. Okay, oh, well, of the geodesics, um, T goes to the exponential map of T V of S. Okay. Now, the idea with Jacobi fields is if we let J of T be um, the following, then we can actually write down a differential equation for J of T. So we work through the computation and we find that the following identity holds, or the following equation holds rather. So this is um, a long, I should say, this is along a geodesic, gamma, given by, um, this, we have the following ODE. Now, for me, um, this didn't, I guess, mean very much to me when I was uh, looking at it, but what I've found as I've gone through these proofs time and um, time, time again, um, Jacobi fields just keep rising, they keep um, uh, appearing. And essentially it's to do with this relationship that the Jacobi fields have with conjugate points. So essentially your, your Jacobi fields allow you to, uh, roughly speaking, say how far you expect the exponential map to be a diffeomorphism. Okay, so uh, this is why Jacobi fields are so important. Okay. So finally, let's just state and um, sketch the, the main result. So this is, like I said, the killing hot theorem. So if we have M is complete and um, simply connected, with constant sectional curvature,
This is, of course, constant sectional curvature equal to either um, 0, 1, or minus 1. OK. So how do we do this? Now, um, the proof is essentially constructive. So we, we explicitly construct this um, isometry. Now, how we do that depends on uh, which, which case we're in. So whether we're in um, k equals 0, k equals 1, or k equals minus 1. So to start off with, um, I'll just mention um, when k equals, um, so we'll begin with k equals 0. Um, or k equals minus one. So of course, um, the, these correspond to Rn and um, the hyperbolic uh, or hype, uh, hyperbolic space. So we fix um, a point. Firstly, in so I'm gonna I'm gonna let n be either Rn or Hn. So we fix the point, point firstly in N and a point P tilde in M. And then we defined a, a linear isometry between the tangent spaces at these points. Now the map that's going to become our um, isometry between our manifolds is given by the following. So um, a couple of things to mention. So first of all, right, um, TPM. So our manifold is complete. So our exponential maps are going to be defined on all of TPM. So we're not going to have any issues with um, the exponential map not being defined. Now, the other thing is I've taken the inverse of the exponential map here, which so maybe we don't uh, a priori a priori we don't actually know the exponential map is going to be um, invertible on all of n. Um, but in fact, when we're in um, these two cases here, we can actually conclude this. So if we have um, sectional curvature that's less than or equal to zero, we can uh, make this conclusion. And how we do that is we use Jacobi field. So um, this is a theorem due to Hadamard. And it tells us that, in fact, um, in this case, um, the exponential map is a global diffeomorphism. So this is well-defined. This exists. So then the next step is we use the theorem due to uh, Cartan to imply that um, F is a local isometry. Okay, so we're sort of building up. Um, after that, we use, um, then we use completeness to actually conclude that this F is a Ramanian covering. And then we use simply connectedness of M to finally conclude that F is an isometry. So we get from completeness. that F is a Ramanian covering. Um, and then we get from simply connectedness.
that F is uh, a global isometry. So this would prove the, the result for, for these two cases. Um, so finally, what we'd want to do is... Hey, Jack, can I interrupt? Yeah, of course. Thanks. Um, I'm just wondering if you could specify maybe slightly more clearly where the fact that sectional curvature is constant actually comes into play. So um, that comes in in each of these steps um, here. So in the theorem, um, essentially to conclude that F is like a local isometry and um, that this is the, the assumptions of those theorems rely on uh, curvature being um, constant. And this comes back to our Jacobi fields. So when we have constant sectional curvature, actually this term here simplifies to be um, expressed in terms of the sectional curvature. And so then we can compute the solutions of our, um, our Jacobi equation in terms of the constant sectional curvature. And then we can make conclusions about, um, about our manifold in, in those scenarios from the solutions of our Jacobi equations. Cool, so it seems that the, um, yeah, the, the constant sectional curvature really comes into play most keenly for this equation here, I presume. Yeah, yeah, so um, actually, yeah, we, we get some dramatic simplifications um, when we, we, we can um, dramatically simplify now. Did write it down. Uh, I don't have it on the top of my head, but um, this, this expression here, um, becomes a lot simpler. And then, in fact, we can just directly solve using standard ODE methods uh, the, the resulting ODE. And so we know explicitly the solutions that, or the, explicitly some of the solutions to this equation. Yeah, thanks. That, that, sure, that's right. Okay, so um, the final part of um, the proof would obviously to would be to consider the case when k equals one. So when we have sectional k curvature equal to one. Now, essentially, the issue that arises here is that we're never going to be able to get that the exponential map is a global diffeomorphism. So. Um, So when we look at the exponential map on the sphere, we begin, say, at the, the North Pole, we find that um, we can keep defining our exponential map until, um, so when we're projecting it back down onto our sphere, um, it comes all the way down here, except it misses out. We have an issue when we, when we hit the South Pole. Okay, so we get, the exponential map gets us everything except for the South Pole. So how we have to correct this is essentially make pretty much the same argument as above, except on, firstly, we do it with Sn minus the South Pole. Then we pick another point somewhere else. Okay, and maybe this is the antipodal point down here. And we do it with Sn minus that antipodal point. And then um, in a rigorous way, we, we glue these two results together to, to create our global isometry. But essentially the, the steps are almost the same. Okay. So that, that concludes uh, my talk. May, maybe probably the, the, the final thing to mention is that if M is not simply connected, we can still get some sort of result by quotienting out by, the, um, by a subgroup of the um, isometry uh, group. And I think James mentioned this in the um, last lecture, so I won't. I won't go into that, but thanks everyone for listening. Cool, thank you. Thank you for that, 
Jack? That's all right. So I know it was quick, but there's there's a lot to build up to if we want to um, go through the, the proof of the killing hop theorem. Thanks, Jack. That's all right. Yeah, so I, I thought it was You're quite valuable seeing, uh, seeing geodesics in this way in the Jacobi field. That's all right. Were there any questions? I, I had a, um, a basic question just about um, the connection. So, so like, if I want to calculate the connection in the way that you did, where you do it along a curve, and then you have a vector field that's only defined on a curve, do I have to, in principle, arbitrarily extend that to a vector field and then compute it on a neighborhood? Or is, is it already defined for these vector fields that are only defined on curves? So, well, so if our manifold is embedded in Euclidean space, then we can compute the connection by uh, yeah, extending just to a small tubular neighborhood of your manifold and then restricting uh, and then computing stuff in Rn plus one or, or, or the Euclidean space and then restricting back down to our manifold. You can also, I'm not quite sure if this is what you were saying, you can also recover the connection from the, um, the notion of parallel transport. So there's a way of, if you um, have vector fields, you can use parallel transport to then define your connection. Because um, yeah. you, you were mentioning it was just a long curve. So I'm not quite sure if that's what you, you were meaning. Yeah, like what I mean is um, like the way I, I don't know how you, how you define it through the seminars, but typically it's defined where you take, it's basically a, a map between pairs of vector fields to another vector field and it satisfies about three or four axioms mm -hmm. like torsion free and linearity and, and things like this. So it's so it just, because I know that you can, for any curve that is regular, you can take a small neighborhood and extend it to a to a vector field defined on a neighborhood of a point but i was just wondering if if you actually have to do that every time or because it looked like you you went straight away to a coordinate expression and is that how you define yeah, in, it in, what, in which in which spot um, um when, you, when, when i was computing the yeah, curvature here we go. yeah the yeah. um the geodesic equation in local coordinates and well, um, you would have to take some sort of extension because it's it's in a sense a derivative, and you can't you can't just you can't say um, anything about a derivative just from knowing a single point. So you would, in this case, you, you would, not in this case, you would always have to make some sort of extension. But um, I guess we we defined it the same way that you're saying as a a set of axioms, and it satisfies these things. So. I okay. guess um, this line here where I've, um, I've said, okay, this is the connection on the sphere. I've sort of missed out that in fact, these two definitions are equivalent. The definition of restricting back down and the definition involving the algebra where you, you give a bunch of axioms sort of thing. Does that, does that answer the question? I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, I mean that, like, I know this is an annoying, an annoying question, but like, what I'm, what I'm talking about is, um, you know, when you define the geodesic equation for a curve, where you have mm -hmm. connection gamma prime, gamma prime equals zero. Yep. Yep. So um, I, I mean so. that, I mean that strictly speaking, you, you're evaluating the connection along curve, a, a vector field that's only defined on a curve. So here, so here, mm -hmm. these these gamma prime t's are not actually vector fields on open sets. They're they're just yeah. maps. Yeah. I I could make a comment about that if if you'd like, Jack. Sure, sure. Thanks, Tim. So I guess technically, when you've got the levi chavita connection, yes, you're on, you're only really allowed to do it with vector fields, and so that means if you want to make sense of this sort of uh, sort of expression, you would always have to extend it. To, to be a vector field. And I guess the, the issue you've got to take care of is making sure that what you end up with doesn't actually depend 
on your choice of extension. Yeah. yeah. And it turns out that in this case, that is, that is the case. Um, and there are two reasons for this. The first is that basically because your, your subscript vector field, um, your levi trivita connection is tensorial in that particular argument. So mm -hmm. basically what that means is that it, it is a derivative in the true sense that, you know, if you simply differentiate it by a bigger vector, then that just scales out the front and the same for linearity. So you got no problem with that argument. Uh, maybe you've got a slight problem with the thing you're actually differentiating because yeah. that's not tensorial. Uh, it only satisfies the Leibniz rule. And I think, I think the way you can get around to that is saying, well, tr well, sure, it's not tensorial, but I'll, at the end of the day, we're taking a derivative. So we only, and we're taking a derivative in the direction of that geodesic. And so that means that technically speaking, we only need to know the information about what it is on the rest of the curve. I, I, I suppose that if you, no matter how you extend it in other directions, this derivative would sort of ignore that. It would only focus yeah. on how it's changing along the curve. So that's, yeah. uh, that's my understanding of what's going on there. Cool, yeah. Thanks for that, Tim. Um, were there any other questions? Great. Well, thanks again for um, having me. Thank you, Jack. Yes, thanks um, for that, Jack. Looking forward to hearing more about Ricci Flow next week. Yeah, so next week we actually get to see some particular solutions um, of Ricci Flow, which is exciting. That was cool. Thanks, Jack. That's all right. Thank you.